Welcome, I can't see everyone. some. <laughs> we have a full audience. We are live. Good evening, everybody. I'm Douglas Hill, co-director of Pasadena Photography Arts. Thank you for joining us. Forum is sponsored by Pasadena Photography Arts, a project of the nonprofit Emerge program of Fulcrum Arts. Our mission is to promote diverse photography projects by established and emerging photographers worldwide through in-person and virtual exhibitions. In addition, PPA is committed to sponsoring educational programs by accomplished photography professionals. To achieve the mission, PPA's ongoing programming includes Open Show Pasadena and PPA Forum. We're also in the process of developing new programs, so please stay tuned. Pasadena Photography Arts presents a monthly program here on Zoom. The forum alternates with Open Show each month. As a primarily volunteer organization, we have worked hard to keep the costs of these programs to a minimum, but there are expenses involved. We ask that you donate whatever you can by visiting our website, PasadenaPhotographyArts.org, and clicking on one of the donate buttons. For those of you who have not experienced Open Show, it's an international platform now in 31 cities and 15 countries, designed to give photographers at all levels an opportunity to show and discuss their creative projects. If you would like to submit your project to Open Show, go to openshow.org, select submit a project, then scroll down to our venue. We are OS-Pasadena East LA. Since we began, we've helped over 140 photographers get their work in front of an audience, many of them for the first time. While we welcome your donations, we also want your feedback. If you have comments or suggestions, please email us at one of the addresses on our website. The September installment of Open Show will be hosted by PPA's own incomparable Debbie Arluck and special guest Granville Carroll on the theme Between Fact and Fiction. Joining us on September 14th with their takes on the theme will be Abigail Teodori presenting In Passing, Cassandra Kloss presenting Mars on Earth, Michael Jansen presenting Strong Attract Attractorcy, and um, Larry Brownstein presenting Uber Fashion. Tonight's event has been made possible in part through a grant from the Pasadena Arts League and a generous donation from Roland Patugan. One great way you can help out is by underwriting one of these events yourself. Email us to find out how. You can follow us and like us on Facebook and Instagram. In addition to being able to unmute yourselves during the presentation tonight, everyone will have the opportunity to type questions and comments into the chat box whenever you like. The event is also being recorded and will be made available on Pasadena Photography Arts YouTube channel. Douglas McCullough is an artist and senior curator at the California Museum of Photography. His work has been shown nationally and internationally in more than 250 exhibitions, including the Victoria and Albert Museum, Art Center College of Design right here in Pasadena, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, and Cooper Union School of Art, New York. His most recent books are In the Sunshine of Neglect, published by Inlandia Institute, and The Great Picture, Making the World's Largest Photograph, part of the Legacy Project Collaborative published by Hudson Hills Press, New York. McCullough is an honors graduate of the University of California at Santa Barbara and holds an MFA in photography and digital media from Claremont Graduate University. Exhibitions curated by him have shown in a range of venues, including the Kennedy Center for the Arts in Washington, Canadian Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg, Centro de la Imagen, Mexico City, um, Flecon Art Center in Moscow, Center for Visual Art Denver in Colorado, and Manuel Alvarez Bravo Center in Oaxaca, the Sejong Center, Seoul, South Korea, Central Academy of Fine Arts, Beijing, China, and Peterson Automotive Museum, Los Angeles, 
and of course the California Museum of Photography. About the imagery he is going to show tonight, McCullough has said, we have entered what may be the golden age of lying with photographs. This talk offers an analysis of the methods and modes of photographic lying, richly illustrated by devious illuminating examples gathered from the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, Douglas McCullough. Hey, a pleasure to be here. Um, in the discussion earlier, I, despite the panel that said that you were to re everyone was to remain muted during, I think you have the ability to unmute yourselves. And people who know me and my work, which is probably a few people here, um, know I kind of operate by chance. And uh, like a close cousin of chance is chaos. So if anybody wants to jump in at any point with questions, I would love it rather than just me doing a long soliloquy here. I, I mean, as people who do know me realize I can do that, but it's more fun if there are comments, questions, critiques, or heckling from people like Jonas Yip or Mark Indig, um, as well as Ann Mitchell. I see various, various people I know here. Um, I will do the usual thing now, which is um, share my screen and then go, are you seeing it? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'll just plunge in. So I assume you're seeing it. We um, are. All right, obviously I'm talking about lying with photographs. And what I realized is that there has been a huge amount of agony, anguish, and ink spilled about the relationship between photographs and truth for the whole history of photography. But very, very little about the relationship between photographs and lying, which is not the same as the relationship with truth. And as the little uh, spiel ahead said, you know, I mean, we clearly are in a golden age of lying of all types. And beyond that, um, the, the lying is being understood or accepted by an awful lot of people um, as reality. So it seemed important to me and actually just super interesting to plunge in and try and think about the relationship between photographs and lying. So this photograph, um, was made during the eclipse in 2017, in August of 2017. I don't know if everybody remembers that, but it traveled across the whole country. My brother in Oregon actually went to Eastern Oregon to see the full eclipse of the sun. And I remember it vividly because it traveled across and was almost full in New York City. And I was at the in on that date, which was I think the 21st of August or something like that, 2017, I was in the Metropolitan Museum and they have this area where you can um, look up through big skylights. It's an atrium space. And I, you know, friends and I were looking through the little, uh, you know, smoked uh, kind of plastic at the eclipse in New York. So this is a photo that was made of the eclipse. And about three hours after the eclipse uh, happened, it was posted in this case by all kinds of people, but this is the New York Police Department Holy Name Society, which is kind of an organization of Catholic um, police officers for, that work for the city of New York. Amazing photo of the solar eclipse 2017, the Lord reigns. And this, this one share got 1.7 million additional shares. Um, it, this image just pinged around the internet. It is kind of amazing, but it's not actually a photograph at all. The story is that a guy in 2011 created it as an illustration. It's completely manufactured. It's not a photograph at all. And his name is Brandon. Um, you can see a little bit of uh, information about him. He's into heavy metal and Bugs Bunny, and he does these kind of, um, I don't know what you call this, um, space-related art or something. And so he posted one, but if facing the other direction, 
and he gets no hits. So he posted it on Obsidian Digital, which is kind of this deviant uh, under the name Obsidian Digital on deviant art. What happened is that after the eclipse, a guy named Don Asmussen in Seattle picked up this image and spun it and posted it with a note saying, see if you can beat this one and claim that he had shot it in Seattle during the eclipse. At which point it is transformed via the internet from being an illustration that had been living there for about six or seven years and unnoticed a handful of people into something that, that goes absolutely viral and claims to be a photo shot on federal way in Washington state by Dan Asmussen. Um, there is some kind of connection here between belief, you know, I mean, religious belief is a belief in unseen, an unseen force that for which there is no proof. And it seems that there's a connection between the fact that this gets 1.7 million shares for the Holy Name Society and that sort of belief. So this category is our manufactured images. There is, they're not even photographs. They're purely illustrative in some fashion or they're created. And you can't say they're quote unquote real at all. I mean, it's just as real as anything else, but does it connect to something in the real world? Not in the way we normally think about photographs. So these manufactured ones can be like this one, a, a wholly manufactured digital image, or you can create them in various ways, old fashioned staging. Um, a comment by Lev Banovich is that once we came to accept photographs as reality, the way to future simulation was open. So we've kind of, we now believe that photographs are this parallel universe that represent the world. And at that point, if you simulate one, then you're simulating the world itself. So it's a convincing why. Um, a statement, a string of words like I'm doing now is clearly seen as an assertion. You know, I mean, it's not somehow linked to something real, but a photograph in Su Susan Sontag's word is stenciled off the real. So even dubious ones have a credibility that somehow a statement does not have. And so in because of that and for other reasons, then photographs are a perfect way to lie. So another example, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in and quibble or argue, feel free <laughs> or suggest or augment, <laughs> but I, I'll issue the invitation again. Um, here's another example. This is a marvelous photo, right? I mean, um, a bloodied KKK member is being attended to by five emergency room workers uh, in, you know, in a hospital ER. Um, it also has gotten a huge number of shares. This one is actually made for an Australian magazine. And the, the photographer told the instruction to the, to the people where he set it all up and then he said, move, like just tilt back and forth. So it looks kind of real. And what's beautiful about this is that, you know, it's, it's, it's set up as a photo, it's a photo shoot. It's not a real thing at all. But it feels kind of wonderful because it's black and white and grainy. Errol Morris, the filmmaker, made the comment that, you know, somehow that lends veracity to a photo and that you will, you know, you'll never see a sharp digital high res image of the Loch Ness monster. No, it's always black and white and kind of grainy, right? Because then we're like, oh man, that looks real because it's just more real. Um, so then it got circulated around, especially in Black Lives Matter. It key, it, this has been circulated periodically for years, but it got a huge amount of attention during the past year for obvious reasons, you know. Um, black doctors treating an injured KKK member is such a heartwarming and wonderful thing. 
Um, and then, of course, there's the photographer, uh, whose name is Sean Izard, who's an Australian photographer, saying, hey, I got this email from a fact checker at USA Today. I made this in 2005. It was shot for this magazine. Um, and now it's being circulated as like a real, <laughs> real photograph. It is a real photograph. It's also a lie, I guess. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, here's an here's another one this is actually a different category i i call this manipulated the previous ones were just wholesale manufactured manipulated is more what we think about as photoshop i'm starting with the ones that are really kind of more standard i guess or that we're we're used to face a man had um the actor will smith's face tattooed over his own face. It's fantastic, right? I mean, it's so good. What, what's wonderful about this is it's sort of this weird mashup of like fame and the freakish, it's irresistible. I mean, it is, you know it's gonna go viral. So it went crazy in 2020, all kinds of people jumped in and commented on Facebook, on Reddit, on Instagram saying, looking at it like it's beautifully clean if you look at the original original you're kind of looking at a you know pixel set here but it's like it's like gorgeous it's got to be real it looks too good and then online sleuths traced the tattoo to a really well-known actually famous european tattoo artist in barcelona named victor chill and this is his style it's like super over the top it's super realistic you can look him up. I mean, he's famous and it's his trademark style, but he also pushes the boundaries out. Like, so then they were like, oh, this is real. This, this is for sure. And then on top of it, Victor Chill said, I did do this tattoo, but you know, it's unbelievable, right? I mean, it's just fantastic. But what he did it on somebody's leg, he didn't do it on the face at all. So Actually, another artist whose, whose name I'm forgetting right now specializes in strange um, you know, smashes people's faces, combines them, all kinds of, I mean, just does faces. So he took this tattoo and put it on somebody's face in Photoshop. So this is a classic you know, what I'm calling manipulated, which are these combination images. What's great is, you know, artists and maybe tattoo artists in particular do very strange things. So it gives it a certain weird credibility. And when things, when lies really take off, it's partly this freakish appeal, but also that it's sort of credible. You know, we, we base our judgments on all available evidence, the complete context. And so if it's a tattoo artist, you go, oh man, they might've done this. I believe this, I'm gonna share this. I think this is real. <laughs> oh, some other examples of manipulated. This is January 20th. So this is inauguration day. And the changeover at the White House there is a changeover where they change everything from one president to the next. So this was the past one that we were all highly relieved about. And this one got, you know, again, went completely crazy. I may have this framed, like fumigating the Oval Office. But it's actually this photo of people fumigating from mosquitoes in Buenos Aires, which is a stock photo you can buy with this photo that's available actually for free that is a photo of the Oval Office at the Bill Clinton Library in Little Rock put together into that, which is kind of a marvelous thing. What's actually funny is that given, you know, this is fumigating the Oval Office, because of COVID, they actually did fumigate the Oval Office, right? <laughs> Lies that really take off sometimes are like closely aligned with weird reality. They spent extra money in the White House because of COVID doing something like this. Um, another one of these that I just couldn't resist. I've collected a lot of them. 
you know, I, I, I've collected a, a huge number and the backstories, which has been really fun. So this one is the MGM lion, um, <laughs> which is like pretty, pretty great. And the comment at the top, if you can't read it because it's so small, is my whole childhood fucked up. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh no, what do they do to the lion? You know, so it's the MGM lion. Um, this is actually the photo that was modified for the first version, which is a lion in Israel that had a vitamin deficiency and they were trying to figure out what to do it. So they cat scanned the cat. Um, and then, you know, you can, you go backwards and you construct that. Once again, what's kind of interesting when you dig into the story, which is, you know, the fun of doing all this is that it, it's kind of uncannily close to what MGM really did because there have been seven different Leo the Lions that MG was called Slats in, in 1917. I looked it up. And when the talkies came along, they couldn't use that one anymore. They needed a lion roaring. So what they really did is got a, the second lion of this whole long string, whose name was Jackie, and they built a black um, sort of scrim and did put his head through and he and he did roar and then they used that one for the first talkie that MGM released and then subsequently for a whole lot of ones until now they have like a really slick one so it's not that different than this uh, <laughs> you guys are ominously quiet but you can you can heckle later if you like um This is like super fun for me. I haven't talked about this project. Like this is the first outing. This is really fun. Um, this is another, this is then our third category. And I'll just make the comment that you don't need to stage a photo or falsify a photo or Photoshop a photo in order to change its meaning. You can just change the caption. You can change the context. And photographs are so slippery that that changes the whole meaning. So this, guy in the blue polo shirt petting the great white shark is his name is Arnold Pointer and he's actually a South African professional fisherman who set free a great white shark that was caught in his fishing nets and so this shark which he named Cindy 17 foot long became friends and followed him around so for two years so he pets Cindy and so forth. Cindy, when he goes out fishing, Cindy comes along and they're friends because he released Cindy. So the photo is completely genuine. It was made by a guy in South Africa who studied sharks. Um, what's completely bogus is actually the story <laughs> because the love story of the shark released from the nets is actually an April Fool's story that was published in 2006 in a French fishing magazine as a April Fool's joke and had this long thing. Once I stop the boat, she comes up to me and she turns her back and she lets me pet her belly and neck in French. And then it was translated into English and has gone viral periodically ever since with sometimes different photos of people encountering sharks in a friendly kind of way. <laughs> so all that's changed there is actually the context, um, which is kind of like everything. I mean, photographs are receptacles that context fills with meaning. And if you change the context, you change the meaning. A, a quote, Susan Sontag, who I keep mentioning, standing alone photographs promise an understanding they cannot deliver. In the company of words, they take on meaning but they slough off one meaning and take on another with alarming ease of that quote. I think I even have it more or less correct. Um, this is another in this category. I don't know if any of you saw this. I saw this go by in social media, this, you know, in 2020 during last fall when we had what were then record breaking number of fires until this year. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is the, a view of the fires from above the clouds. And it went crazy, you know, it was everywhere. So, so, and everybody had a different, you know, the religious right was, oh my God, it's the end of times. 
and you know the the left was oh global you know climate change and global warming and catastrophe we've got to do something uh, um, the reality is that the photo was is a hawaiian sunset shot by a an air force pilot um, off of Oahu, and it's a setting sun over the Pacific below the cloud layer. But once you have something like this, it's like, that can't be just a photo, a sunset photo. Um, and it's, but it's not California, it's not fires, it's not volcanoes, it's not the end of the world, it's a sunset photo with the sun below clouds on a really freaky day shot from a C-17 at 30,000 feet. Um, I love this. It's so great. No words, the rescue of one of the animals that threw themselves into the water trying to save themselves from the Amazon rainforest. This is actually, you know, I mean, it's a real photo, unaltered, um, rescuing a jaguar trying to escape the wildfires in the Amazon basin in 2019. Um, the Truth of the matter, though, is that this photo was shot by a Brazilian photographer, Noni Manguera, and from a whole bunch, you can find video that she also shot about three years earlier. It's a rescued jaguar. The mother was shot by hunters, and they, the, a military group in Manaus rescued and, you know, keep this jaguar, and they go out swimming with it. All these photos were shot of like swimming around with the Jaguar, who's part of the military group. Um, it has actually nothing to do whatsoever with the rainforest on fire. And so this category is kind of, this one is kind of complicated in the sense that it's like a false story, but it's also time shifted. And so that's this category. If you change the time something happened, then you change the meaning of what happened. I mean, all photographs, we know they, they tinker with time, they freeze it, they seize it, they stretch it. If you, you know, so if you shift the time represented in a photograph, you shift the meaning with it. There's a John Berger quote, the great critic who said, the true content of a photograph is invisible. It's, it derives from a play, not with form, but with time. Um, and it's kind of like photography is a way to like measure and fold the cloth of time itself or, or something like that. Um, I'm not being as wonderfully eloquent as John Berger, who's a great writer. <laughs> um, so here, a kick-ass photo from the Normandy landings. This one has gone viral periodically because it kind of is like marvelous. So the Normandy beach landings, you know, Omaha Beach, uh, during Operation Overlord, the insane, bloody uh, uh, invasion of Europe in June of 1944. And the women of the Red Cross are kind of jauntily landing at, at Omaha Beach. But of course, they, this is time shifted. This actually, they are Red Cross workers. The photo was made in 1944, but it, it's not the D-Day invasion of Normandy. It's actually landing on the beach at the French Riviera. Um, and so it's kind of a different situation <laughs> altogether. And it's gone viral off and on for years, kind of like the tide itself coming or going in this case. <laughs> and every so often the Red Cross will actually jump into the social media circulation of this photo and say, no, 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 it's not Omaha Beach. And they feel compelled to correct the record. Um, Here's, here's another kind of marvelous one, this Kamala Harris being sworn in. And it got incredible circulation because, you, and you can see right here, she did not place her hand on the Bible. Instead, depending on how you, you know, which post you're looking at, it was on her gloves or on her purse or on any number of other objects that were on top of the Bible. And therefore, why won't she place her hand on the Bible? Would she be damaged by touching a Bible? And so forth and so on. 
Um, in reality, it's kind of a crazy thing to make a claim like that based on one angle. So this category, I, I'm calling extract, which is the framing, the ang point of angle of view, the t exact time. I mean, your photographs are pulling a little moment. And so you can use that fact and always have to lie with it. But if you're gonna do it at this event where cameras are aimed from every possible angle, you're insane to try and make a claim like that because you can find 3,000 other points of view in video showing that she had two Bibles. So the top Bible is actually a friend of the family who was sort of like the caretaker and babysitter for Kamala and her sister when her mother was working. And that's her Bible. And the bottom Bible, Bible is the Justice Thurgood Marshall, you know, civil rights pioneer. So she used two Bibles. But when you cherry pick the angle, then you can say, oh, well, wait, she, did, she didn't do the, the, you know, the Bible at all. Essentially, composition, crop, you know, it, the angle of view distorts things. What's left out of the frame is just as important as what's in the frame. We were kind of chatting about that before everybody flooded into this talk. So this, I mean, this talk is sort of like looking at how to lie with photography. So I hope everybody who's listening takes notes and tries to lie as much as possible using these various techniques. You can mix and match them, you know, hybrids are wonderful. Um, so this is essentially pointers on how to go about lying if you really want to lie, which of course human beings do all the time. Um, a couple of quotes um, about this extracted category is that um, Thomas Ruff, photography pretends you can see everything that's in front of the camera, but there's always something beside it. Or another one, Stephen Shore, the great photographer, a photograph has edges, the world does not. Um, here's another one. This, this is uh, a heat wave in Arizona and I forget the year, the summer temperatures have, are, have gotten so hot, they're actually melting cars in Arizona. Uh, um, and this photograph, anonymous, which so much on the internet is, has been circulated. It also has been circulated proving that it was incredibly hot in Saudi Arabia or any number of other locations. But the, the reality is that the photographs are real. They're un, you know, you know, not manipulated in any way. But what happened is these cars were parked in an apartment um, parking lot, apartment building parking lot near the university in Tucson. And there was a fire at night in, this, in the building across the street like a three alarm blaze that was completely out of control and melted these cars. And somebody showed up and shot this photo and posted it saying, oh my God, cars are melting because it's gotten so hot in Arizona or Saudi Arabia or Oman or any, any number of places. Um, so it's kind of wonderful. Um, there's another, I have another category which is called, I'm calling mirrored, which is, these are essentially photographs that are, you know, in some way, I think of them as like co-signed by fame. So if a photo in our weird celebrity obsessed world portrays or appears to portray celebrity or spectacle, the iconic, the mythic, um, you know, famous or infamous, then it kind of takes on power by transference. You know, images like that, even if they're staged or imitations or something, are, are kind of make an irresistible claim on our attention. Um, in this case, Anonymous, the hacker community, hacked and got this photo and released it. So that gives it another layer of credibility. Oh my God, Anonymous, they, you know, they're, they're awesome. Um, but all of this kind of connects to, you know, there's a great Andy Warhol quote, which is my idea of, which I always quote because it's so great. 
my idea of a good picture is one of one that's in focus and of a famous person. <laughs> Which at the Museum of Photography, we have this huge collection of Andy Warhol Polaroids, you know, that he shot himself and they're like all famous people, or at least people who are famous in their day. Um, there's another wonderful quote, you can tell I collect photo quotations, um, is uh, Don DeLillo, the writer, we're not here to capture an image, we're here to maintain one which is kind of wonderful, like, you know, we're not trying to create one, trying to reinforce one. The reality on the Trump photo is even the real photo is even better than that cropped one. It is so great. Um, it actually was made by an artist whose name is Allison Stewart. Um, Allison Jackson, I've got that totally wrong. Allison Jackson, who trades on this sort of celebrity the power of celebrity photos. If you look at her website, she's done all kinds of people. It's just actually marvelous. Some photo, she's British. She auditioned 160 different Trump impersonators to cast this Trump. Um, and it's so, it's so fantastic. This is one of these things where we sort of wanna believe it's true because, you know, partly that Trump is this weird media creation. You know, he came out of the media world and this is the media world version of, of Trump. Um, and, you know, all of his orangeness and deceits and, you know, you know, fronting and prevarication. So you, when you look at this, you kind of go, oh, that's just like, I wanna believe this. I wanna believe this. Um, and once it's anonymous, did it. It then. So this is the mirrored category I have. I've collected between 10 and 15 photos uh, that are like specimens. Yeah. That's what I can't hear. I can't hear that. Can anybody hear that question? Is it a question? One, one last category which is uh, denied. So this is category number seven. This, you probably recall this photo, it got a lot of play. This is the border at San Ysidro. And people are fleeing, you know, migrants who are on the Mexican side are fleeing tear gas, being fired by ICE agents. This was during the run up to the election when uh, the kind of hysteria about caravans of women and children are going to threaten our borders. I'm like, the whole time I'm thinking, really? Women and children? Caravans? <laughs> that doesn't seem that plausible, actually. <laughs> um, so this, this photo is a genuine photo. Um, this was shot by a Reuters photographer. Kim Kyung Hoon, lots of other people shot similar photographs, right? And it's right around the election. Um, so, but what happened immediately within less than a handful of hours after that was pho photograph was made, people jumped in and started saying, this was all staged, that everybody are what they call crisis actors that somehow this whole scene, which was captured, you know, in that photograph and other photographs was set up, that everybody was hired and that everybody was carefully staged. So this markup was part of what, what this set of claims were put forth, which is, okay, these people on the left uh, in the upper left are posing as if fleeing and then somebody else is shooting the, the photo and here's some on standing a cameraman on the far right past these figures and then this group of people are being marshaled to run toward the camera to stage this and that nothing actually happened here except this complex staging. The problem is that you can go track down this woman and her children. So her, her name is Maria Metza and she's from Honduras and she was not trying to cross the border. She's not part of the caravans. She was here watching this whole scene and then 
what essentially happened is the ICE agents kind of freaked out on the American side and started firing tear gas across the border and everybody fled. She thought, you know, her kids got tear gas in their eyes and she thought, oh my God, I gotta get, I gotta get out of here. So, you know, you can find the people and go, no, 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 we were not, we were not crisis actors at all. This is, this is like real. So the point on this one is that obviously if something is a quote unquote genuine photo of a real event and you claim it's false, that's kind of like its own form of lie. You are denying truth in a photograph, whatever truth exactly is. So those are, those are my seven categories with what I'm calling sort of type specimens in the same way that like a geologist or a biologist, they get a type specimen of a trilobite. And this is the, you know, the perfect example of that trilobite and ends up in a museum somewhere. So that's what I'm trying to do. Collecting these images, some of which I've shown you here. So the categories starting from the top are manufactured, which is wholesale creation, whether at this point it can be, uh, you know, completely um, AI created, you know, super realistic digital or staged but it's like there is no reality in it. it is completely completely manufactured or there's manipulated which tends to be these photoshop kind of mashups or where things are changed in certain kinds of ways to manufacture it like the face being the you know the tattoo being put on the face and so on and then there's a gigantic category full of all kinds of wonderful things decontextualized you just change the caption you change the information time shifted you just move the time there's one that i haven't shown you which is a uh, supposedly the day before the january 6th event in washington dc a gigantic crowd of people in washington assembling ahead of the kind of storming of the capitol but in reality, the photo, which is this overhead view in Washington with this giant, giant, giant group, was taken several years earlier at an anti-gun rally. But you just time shift it so that you claim it happened on a certain date when it didn't. Um, and, or the Jaguar that was years, three years prior to the fires of 2019. And then there's the one that has always sort of haunted photography, which is the extracted one where it's the angle of view, the composition, the precise moment that ends up being, you know, misleading where the, the photograph has edges, but the world doesn't. You know? And we all take advantage of that. And then the more obscure ones really are mirrored where it's playing off of celebrity. Um, and, and finally, denial. It's a true image, unmanipulated but you deny its reality. So that is my strange uh, analysis of lying with photographs. And I think we're at about close to 45 minutes. So I don't know if people have comments or I'll, I can stop sharing and we well, can talk, which is always fun. Okay, yeah, I mean, we can certainly do that. Um, <laughs> Doug, I, or, I have a. Um, that, I think the 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 images are wonderful, um, and they're really quite remarkable. And the categories um, made a lot of sense to me that these are things that that you know people seem to be engaging in very specifically. But I'm wondering, and I, I don't, it might not even be something that's of interest to you. But what's the danger in all of this? Because it seems to me that that you know there's there's probably something uh, very nefarious, potentially. Um, this, that can come out of all of this. You know, what, what's interesting is, is the, the golden age of lying isn't just with photographs, it's, it's the golden age of lying, period. And I think my own thinking about this, and I have been reading a lot about it, which I tend to do, is that there have always been liars. You know, I mean, humanity lies. The question is who, how widely can they circulate and who is willing to believe them? And clearly we're in an age where more and more people are willing to believe 
big, complex sets of interlocking lies. So these structures of lies, photographs are one building block that reinforce these larger structures of lies. And I think ultimately that's like really corrosive because you have separate communities developing their own point of view on the world that are completely disconnected from other groups. And we might sit around and say, hey, I've got the corner on the market. I think I really believe the real world, but, and I suppose, you know, you can make your make cases that that's true in some cases, but what's really happening is there are diverse groups that are just have completely different belief systems and they're buttressed by not just superstructures of lies, but by photographs then reinforce those lies. And obviously I've had conversations with other photographers about this as I've been working on it. And so then the question is, what about video? Well, yeah, I know video is like the same and maybe more so. I look at video as just photographs that move, you know? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's a real key question. What is the danger? What is the danger? How significant? It, what do you guys think? I mean, I kind of look well, at it and go, Good God, you know, it's pretty strange. There's no <laughs> shared reality anywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, the one of the things that occurs to me is then we end up with um, situations like using the excuse of weapons of mass destruction to go into a country and start a war. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's about as, as critical as I think it can get. And, and certainly imagery can be used to support that. A thesis like that, if, if that's what you want to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, uh, I, I'd like to urge everybody, you can I saw Sandra um, Klein yourself. raise a hand. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there, there's several people who've raised their hands. So yeah. jump in. Douglas, and there's how much of this is political? And also, is this all due to the internet? Is this all internet stuff? You know, would this be happening without? You know, I mean, I, I think it would be happening, but it wouldn't circulate. And, you know, at the moment where we've, we've obviously passed away from the time when a photograph was an image, we we're away from the image and into flow. So all of these examples ended up just with monolith varying amounts, but huge amount of flow. I mean, they hit millions and millions. And I don't think, I can't imagine this would operate in the same way. It'd be kind of like, if everyone was vaccinated in this crazy ass country, you know, then the, the virus couldn't circulate. And if you can't circulate, it just wouldn't spread. So would they, they, you know, someone would create this, this, you know, fish story of the shark was saved and, you know, but it wouldn't have a life that went on year after year after year after year. Um, that's kind of a benign example because it's kind of funny and quirky, but not all of them are benign and a lot are actually malign. I didn't show mostly malign examples here. I, I think it's deeply, these are all from the internet, obviously. Yeah. And I think it, they're internet dependent. They live in that ecosystem of the internet. Yeah. With this sort of amplification system of, of social media, it's crazy how something can be one little photo and drop into a, I mean, it's like putting an eye turns black you know i mean that can happen on the internet <laughs> i don't know it's kind of marvelous and absolutely terrifying at the same time <laughs> other hands oh yeah Ann Mitchell. Yeah. tony well, luna um you had a question yeah uh, first of all uh when do you have time to do all of this i mean this is absolutely marvelous i'm blown away at uh at, at the curating of all of this second fo follow-up question is um When's the book coming out? <laughs> you know, this is a new project. I don't know. Yeah. You know I, I think it would be marvelous. I'm, I'm a believer in books, although I think this should live on the internet. You know, I mean, that yeah. the hope is to get on the internet first and then see what happens. As far as when, um, when I have time to do, I just never like stop. You know, it's, it's like addictive. This was addictive. This is addictive because you just fish in and go, oh my God, another example. Like, yeah. oh my God, you know, well, and it sort of triggers the thinking and what, so what, on. Uh, yeah, what came my way was the opportunity that exists for doing political cartoons as, you know, as political satire. Uh, you know, it's, it's always been illustration, why not photo illustration uh, in that modality? Uh, and um, 
Guy, I just congratulate you for, for all the hard work and for the insights. Oh, and for the quotes too. <laughs> <laughs> I just, the quotes are like the same as these. They're just stolen from other people. <laughs> yeah, but they add, they add spice. So I appreciate yeah, yeah, and I and I footnote it, so I like I'm not I'm not going to steal credit for the quotes, but I do love quotes. So if people like photo quotes, photoquotations.com is my crazy site. Um, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for the comment. And, and you were going to chime yeah, in at something. Um, well, I had two thoughts about it. One, I was wondering if there's a generational issue. So there's people that um, you know kind of really were raised thinking maybe because of film, but really thinking that an image that they saw really did connect to reality. There's a whole other generation, many generations kind of coming up though, that, you know, are perfectly fine with putting a cat nose on their nose and ears. And they don't have any connection at all with photo being real. And so I wonder if, you know, like this whole idea of it being about the lie is only if you have this sense that it should be true and maybe generationally that yeah. won't fly you know but and that that's a great observation it raises an additional question which i'm curious what people would think is that if if everyone say the generation we're all dead everyone else comes up and they really give no credence slash credibility slash connection to reality to any photo anymore what how does that change a world in which we really experience much of the world through still or moving images and none of them have any longer that stenciled off of reality all, all suspect every one of them what does that do like where are we because we do build our world out of you know i mean i've never been to the top of mount everest obviously but i have a feeling that I really have a sense of what the top of Mount Everest is because I went and saw the IMAX film. I've seen a million photos, you know, and so on. But the photo, you know, photos deliver us the world. What if we no longer believe the world it, that photos deliver us? <laughs> Where are we? Yeah. The other thing I thought was interesting is that um, it really shows the importance of words to photographs. And when you think about like fine art photography, this image of yours is supposed to sit on a wall by itself, pure, and, and you know, it, it does its whole thing. But in reality, everything we looked at today was really based yeah. on its connection. To I, you know, I'm in the camp of uh, A, that words give meaning to the photographs and that the photographs are intensely slippery and utterly dependent on language and context. Mm -hmm. I, I just think so. And also in a fine art context, I mean, most of my own projects are text and image. Right. And it's, it's really out of crazy frustration of going to show after show after show, like there's some amazing thing on the wall. And, you know, and all, all it will say is Pittsburgh, 1963. I'm like, son of a bitch, give me something here. What is that? Like, really? So I'm like, okay, on my own stuff, I'm gonna give you something. But my rule is basically, if it's in the photo, don't put it in the text. You know, if it's in the text, don't have it in the photo so that they kind of are in collision with each other and, you know, a synthesis comes out of them. But it, it was out of frustration out of that kind of high modernist, you know, MoMA, Sarkowski of like only one little thing, you know? I'm like, you idiots, why, what's the rule there? I don't know, so, um, but also the meaning isn't apparent in the photos. They are wonderful things without it, but they are different with, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a purist in any sense, for sure. <laughs> I like you people, you guys are all right. <laughs> Other comments? I wanted to point out I just out wanted that... to read the comment from... Oh. oh, sorry. I, was gonna I do just the wanted same to point thing. out Mark. Yeah, Mark Indig's comment is really funny. He said, you've now got me wondering if your bookcase has been altered behind you. <laughs> and I was thinking the same thing because it's got that nice slant to it. <laughs> Mark Indig, what a smart ass. Um, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it's been altered um, in digitally. It, it's actually all straight. 
No, it was built that way in my studio. That actually is that way. And, it, and if anybody has the idea of having tilted things, don't do it because I didn't realize that when the books are all leaning, that it's really hard to get a book out. They are a lot of weight. It's a pain in the ass. If you get it out, you can't get it back in. So it's a kind of a catastrophe. Don't do it. Yeah. But it, no, it really, it really is like that. <laughs> it's my studio. I get to do what I want. The Dr. Seuss of bookcases. There's a comment. <laughs> I like it. I, I could Photoshop it straight, right? You know, um, and then- a, Doug, yeah. you've done such a, I, I really love this, this presentation because you, you make us think of things in, in different ways. And, and Anne brought up something interesting as, as you were also talking about text and what the generations are. Who's reading? Who's taking time to read? Or if we're just whizzing by something and seeing, it's like, oh my God, did you see this? And so we make things up, you know, it's our perception and our interpretations as we go because we, we whomever we is, right? Yeah. These groups are not taking time to read. So when you have the text or don't have the text, it's going to change it completely. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on another show right at the moment of my own stuff with the writer Susan Strait. I don't know if anybody knows Susan Strait, Southern California writer, um, National Book Award and everything. She's really great. Um, and she she's writing the text. I'm doing the photos. And we're having audio, you know, just a QR code and her reading it for all the people who just, you know, hit the QR code and listen to the, the text isn't that long, but it is text. So you got to kind of work it. I don't know what else, I don't know what else to do. Um, well, I, 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 I appreciate that. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, go ahead. I'm crossing over because I, uh, what I meant by that as well is that certain generations, when we're talking about their microwave generation, that was us. And then there's the MTV generation. And then you have the TikTok generation. So we have less attention span is what I mean in terms of reading text and and taking in the information or even listening to it is kind of what i mean what are, what are your thoughts about about that and how that might change the context as well you know if we were if we were smart this group we and we're interested in having getting work out we we would adapt to this and have everything be ultra bite-sized you know i mean what can you say have a little string of things that are you know not not more than seven words it's long and so on. I don't know. There's the, the famous Da Vinci quote about art. Art is the sum of limitations. So if you say, all right, I can, ha I can only have seven words per image, then, you know, then there you are, you know, you just like hem yourself in. I don't know. Other comments, I'm um, very sure. Well, Twitter did enlarge its uh, number of words <laughs> or characters, and that five minute video channel did fail. <laughs> that's true that's true that's very true i know it's so limiting i you know i'm a reader i love to read i totally do i read about a book a week maybe a little more um while making images and curating shows all right, all right cool any uh, other comments or, yeah, yeah. Uh, douglas i got a question uh so what is your advice to photographers and even non-photographers out there with all this imagery and all the lies that are that that is out there that is the internet um what advice could you give people i mean we're supposed, we're supposed to question everything right but it seems that way even with uh, maybe reputable news sources we still gotta kind of question everything um, yeah it's, I'm, yeah even the news sources themselves i mean a lot of these uh like reuters ap bbc all run full-time bureaus that look at images and try and figure out, is that true? Is that altered? Is that false? And then post things. I mean, it's not just Snopes, right? It's all these news agencies, the New York Times. Um, I, I, I guess the, the question is really, that's like a two-part question. One is how do you be a consumer of images and figure out like what's true? Constant work, right? I mean, it's, it's true. Or you do kind of what Ann Mitchell was saying and say, oh, everything is fake until proven correct, you know, and just the default is the, is the version of like, it's all false. The other part of it though, would in my head would be, okay, if everybody's lying um, 
and the lies are getting traction, hey, go with the flow. Try and lie as convincingly as you can. Create projects where actually it's completely carefully created falsehoods with the aim of getting traction. I don't know, you know, I mean, that's, when there was all this kind of anguish about, which there still is about surveillance. I don't know, I was shooting a whole lot of photos in Hollywood for a long time. And they put up a bunch of surveillance cameras up and down Sunset and Hollywood and so on. And I, I, had, a, I had a photo idea, one of my many projects I don't have time to do, which was to hire people and be involved yourself to cause enough trouble at a specific intersection on Hollywood Boulevard that they put up a camera. So it's a way to make photographs like indirectly by causing so much trouble, they actually put a camera there. And then that camera creates photos. So, I mean, go with the flow. If you've got something going, then like, I don't know. This is my contrary in nature coming through. <laughs> really, so, so yeah, it's sort of, Sophie sort of uh, the ring doorbell situation at the moment where everything yeah. is vi videoed all the time in given neighborhoods anyway right there was a there there, there was a, a band in in uh, london that uh, you know that did a music video where you can you could request after a certain amount of time from all the cctv cameras posted all over london you know there's so many that you could get after a time delay you could request the the footage from a certain camera so they went around and performed portions of their song under camera after camera after camera waited the interval and then requested and cut together a music video <laughs> shot by surveillance cameras of them performing on street corners and stuff <laughs> i'm like that's pretty great yeah uh okay mark indig since the text is tied to the image to be a lie can a picture without text also be a lie Whew, now we're into strange territory there this is like the tree falls in the forest kind of thing um <laughs> i don't know what do you think does it have to have text to be a lie so the core question there is is a picture without text making a claim that is false i don't i don't know yeah some photos have an inherent claim in them, I think, and therefore could be true or false, I think, in some way. Cool. All right, this is good. It's gotten strange. <laughs> well, so, so, Doug, when you say a lie, we're, we're going down a rabbit hole there because we know that photography, we talked about a little bit of like, that we're all, um, when we look at like the migrant worker, we know that there was a bigger frame and that Dorothea Lang only gave us a little piece of the puzzle. So would we say that that's a lie or would we say that's an interpretation or where, you know, that's where the grayness all happens? Yeah, yeah. No, I know, essentially they're all clipped out out of, clipped out of the world. And so there's always something outside the frame. I guess it becomes a, a judgment question of how important is what's outside the frame. If the cars are melting in Arizona and it's actually a fire across the street and you don't show the fire, then that seems like an omission that reaches a certain level. But what about the migrant mother, you know? If, you don't, if you're not showing the rest of the, you know, the pea pickers camp that she's at, then, um, you know, but that's what photography does. Photography is, is essentially organized lying. I should be quoting myself. <laughs> or, or, or maybe it's not exactly organized lying. Maybe it's also, it can be organized lying, but it could also be, that's what we do as photographers, we actually, and so that's our view at the time. Is that necessarily a lie or is that our view and interpretation of an event? You know, what's weird about this project is I have tried really, really carefully not to get into the discussions of truth, even small t truth, and just steer away from it. But inevitably, like the inverse of a lie is not necessarily truth. If this, if this is a lie, the opposite is, doesn't have to be truth. That's clear. So you try and dodge things that way. But as soon as you're involved in 
labeling things as a falsehood of some kind or another, you're on tricky territory. Everybody's going to argue, you know, oh, that doesn't go so far. You know, we'd have to have like a trial judge for every single image. In this case, it's easy because a curator's job is to pick things and then like organize them and label them. So I get to do it and then you guys can argue with me. <laughs> or the internet can argue with me, which so I assume Douglas, it will. What, what would you say about Richard Prince? Oh, Richard Prince? Yeah, in terms of hmm. lying. Yeah, um, you know, I've always loved the appropriationists, whether it's Sherry Levine or Richard Prince or whatever, for the sheer audaciousness of it. Um, I think that's not a question of lying so much as a question of is that thievery or is that appropriation, you know? Um, I, you know, years ago, I would taught classes and would use Sherry Levine as like, okay, she's using a four by five camera, she's trying to absolutely replicate what's in front of that camera um, and make a true, you know, version of what's in front of the camera, but what's in front of the camera is an Edward Weston photo. So where does that get you, you know? So that is her doing straight up traditional photography of a photograph. Um, and Richard Prince is no, really no different. I like them all actually, I think it's marvelous. And in truth, I've been working on pieces for another project where they're Google image search pieces. So you, you can't really, you know, if you want to photograph envy, it's kind of hard, you know? I mean, photography has got to have something in front of the camera and the conceptual things like envy or, but you can Google image search search Envy and get, you know, 80 million hits. So you have a Google image search database version of Envy. And it's like a meta photography. It's like right. an Uber photography, right. everything tagged as Envy and then do these big, huge pieces that have 800 selected Envy images. So that's the same Richard Prince, just take, take somebody else's image. I think once they're loose in the world, man, they're, they're free game. You know, and that's just the way it should be. Use them up. Don't make any more. There's too many. It's like it's like the late Roman emperors devaluing the currency. Smash your cameras. Just Google image search things. <laughs> We're defacing the currency for sure. This has gotten really strange now. I like it. <laughs> You know what I just learned? I just learned that Eugene Smith and uh, Kappa's images were not truthful, that, that they're a lie. Had Wait, which ones? Too? Both Kappa's and Eugene Smith's, that his were staged. You know, everybody has argued about the, the falling soldier Kappa image forever and ever, um, whether that's truthful or not. Gene Smith? You know, some things in Gene Smith are fake. I know some of them where he like, you know, burned in things that weren't really there to cover something up, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure about Gene Smith or Kappa for that matter. Yeah, that's why I was pretty amazed. And, and just, well, let's just suppose that that's true. Okay. Right. Let's just suppose all of these truths, right. That we thought were true and, 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 and <laughs> the migrant worker, right? Cause like, like they're selling something. Cause some of them, these were, were magazines. These were photographers that were making work to sell a story, right? right so right. it's changed over time, our perception of even how the work was made. There's like a whole other rabbit hole to go down. Yeah, I don't know. Kappa, I mean, the story of how Kappa got started is kind of marvelous where he's, you, you, some of you or all of you might know this it was like, He's Hungarian. He shows up in Paris. He wants a job. He really has no real experience. He gets his girlfriend, Gerda Taro, to go into, um, you know, a magazine that might hire and say, man, this great photographer's coming into town. You ought to hire this guy. And then he shows up. He's made up a new name, claimed all this experience, and gets a job. So it starts with, you know, kind of fronting <laughs> from the start. But he's Robert Kappa. I mean, he's amazing, right? So I, 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 I don't. I don't want to be the generation that doesn't believe that Kappa is real. Somehow Kappa should be real. I want to believe Kappa is real. <laughs> I 
I think when you're talking about real or not, that is very different than lying or not. Like lying seems to have a very strong motivation. I think when I'm thinking about Kappa's work and let's say Smith's work, then I'm not looking at one image. I'm looking at a body. Of yeah. work. So I'm looking, I mean, that's one thing that I really miss about film is proof sheets, you know, because you've got this real sense of how somebody yeah. worked and, and, you know, so I, I think that, that was it real or was it not? I mean, I went to a commercial photography school, so we learned that, you know, everything is, you know, it's all about the angle and what you, you know, yeah, sure. but I think that for those larger questions, I think you have to look at a box body of work. You can't look at a single image because well, then you get a sense of what they're trying to say and what they're trying to do. Yeah, and that, that, that gets to something that I have been thinking about in relation to this, which is intent. Does it, mm -hmm. for it to be a lie, does it, is it required that somebody sets out to, or not? But what's interesting on the internet is that it doesn't require that. It can be a image that is just out there and through quirks of algorithms and sharing and so on, it becomes, it takes on a different aspect and a different context almost on its own in a way, not through any malign action, and then explodes. So it's like the system generates its own falsehoods mm -hmm. internally out of, out of just the sheer abundance of the ecosystem of the internet. So it's no longer I have to set out to fake you out and create a falsehood. It can just arise out of it in the way that hothouse flowers grow up. You know? So that's its own danger right there. It's like, how we, do we have a system now which is essentially you know, corrupt in some way or generates that corruption? I don't know. Yeah. Hey, is this fun or what? Okay, we're losing people though. Maybe we should wrap up. What time is it? Oh, okay. Shall well, we wrap I, I just up? Have, you guys are in charge. I, I just have one comment that I wanted to make just before we, <clears throat> we do split. And I'm not sure where it goes, but um, there was an announcement uh, by Adobe about, uh, well, several months ago that they had um, come up with software that would allow people to determine whether an image was um, real or whether it was Photoshopped. Um, I haven't seen that that software um, marketed anywhere, so I don't know. And I'm I'm wondering who's going to be using it. And what are they going to be using it for? I mean, I could see, you know, like in in a court case or something, you needed to to show the veracity of of some imagery. But um, otherwise, what you know, what's that all about? Yeah, I mean, there. I've been reading about the software as well. I mean, it it finds if you clone. Pat, stamp or so on it finds little minute patterns of pixels at a, at a level you would never find and and figures out that that the images have been altered um I, you know i i have no idea what that is useful for given that there are so many ways that photographs can lie photoshop's just one of them i'm like fine okay yeah. right you know it doesn't figure out the context of this image has been changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, not one pixel has been altered. You know, I'm like, what good is that going to do you? I mean, you know, but yeah. 2.0. No. <laughs> right, 2.0. <laughs> cool. So, All right. Yeah, I'm, this has been an incredible uh, conversation and um, provocative and, and um, as advertised. And um, I, I think everybody on the call has, has been thoroughly entertained and, and uh, um, <laughs> yeah, um, stimulated by it. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Oh, I totally thank you, Doug. Thank <laughs> yeah. You. All right, total fun. Hope to see you next month. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you. Um, See you I, next I, month for open I, show. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, the little bit of my um, housekeeping just to let every, uh, remind everybody that uh, we do in fact have um, an open show coming up um, on uh, September fourteenth, um, and um, uh, which will be uh, showing four photographers' work. Um, and um, hope you 
all can join us then. Um, please check in with the website or, or Facebook or, and um, other places that uh, we, we let people know about what's going on. Um, and um, if you, uh, we also urge you to go to our website briefly if you can um, and um, donate so that we can continue to uh, put on um, programs like this. Um, this has been great. Thanks again, Doug. Really appreciate it. And um, everybody. Amazing. Thank you for showing up. We appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Night. All right, bye.